Uh, today we're continuing our series uh, called When Jesus Shows Up. And I wanna talk about a man, I'm gonna introduce you to him, we're gonna step into his life who has leprosy. And what this man's going to show us by his life is an outward sign of our own inward condition. He's gonna show us an outward sign, an outward picture of our inward condition. One of the things, and we learned a lot of lessons, but one of the lessons we learned through COVID was the impact of isolation, right? Like, like we maybe not didn't know before, but we know it now. We know how important human contact is, right? I mean, like Zoom was fun for a season, right? And then, and you know, because everybody, you remember how fun it was to put that moving background behind you on the Zoom call? And we banned those at Long Island. <laughs> I just got over, you know, somebody was in space and then the White House. So we banned them. No, but it was fun for a season. But now it's like, okay, Zoom has lost its luster. Human contact for a, for a person is important. In fact, uh, I found a study on orphanages in uh, third world countries. Some of the orphanages they did a study on and found that children and infants who were not held or had human contact were 30% more likely to die. The, the mortality rate was 30% more than children who were held. Now you may say, hey, I'm there now. I, I feel isolated, Pastor. I'm surrounded by hundreds of people in here. I'm at home and I have family and friends around, but I feel isolated. I feel alone. I feel alienated. Well, you're gonna be able to relate to the leper this morning. He felt isolated. We don't know for sure, but probably for years. This is a man who yearns for human contact. He yearns for intimacy. He desires fellowship with another person. And then one day Jesus shows up. And what we're gonna see in this series is that every time Jesus shows up, everything changes. Do you remember the time Jesus showed up in your life? Anybody? I know for my life, everything changed for him. And what the leper is gonna show us today is two things. One, he's gonna show us the seriousness of our own condition, our sinful condition. And secondly, he's gonna give us a solution or show us the solution to the problem. If you have a Bible, I hope you do, turn with me to Luke chapter five. Uh, we'll camp out on Luke chapter five, verse 12. We like to say word at Long Hollow when we get there. We know the word changes our life. Word. If you're at home, you can say word. If you're in here, you don't have a choice. So let's do it again. If you're there, have play. Amen. Thank you. Amen. The word of the Lord. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man was there who had leprosy all over him. Now this is the beauty of Luke and one of the joys of kind of walking through Luke. Luke is a doctor. So he's giving a medical diagnosis to us that the other guys missed. Because Matthew and Mark talk about this account, account, but they missed this. Apparently Luke diagnosed him and said, this is a bad case. This is a serious case of leprosy. He saw Jesus fell face down and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me, underline this word, clean. Reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him saying, I am willing, be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then he ordered him to tell no one, but to go show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them, the word of the Lord. Let's pray as we, as we begin. Lord, I'm gonna ask that as we study the outward condition of the leper, it would give us spiritual understanding of the inward sinful condition of our own heart. And for those in here who have never experienced a cleansing and those who have never been made clean, I pray today is the day. They don't have to live in sin. They don't have to be plagued by sin. Per, a person in here doesn't need to be paralyzed by sin. And so Holy Spirit, we're gonna ask for you to have your way today. Convict our hearts, comfort us, challenge us, bring us close to Jesus. We ask it in your name. Amen. Uh, two insights, as I told you, we're gonna talk about, uh, about sin in our own life. Number one is this, the seriousness of his condition. So we'll talk about the man, the seriousness of his condition. I told you I wanted you to step into his world. So for just a moment, 
I wanna paint a picture of what the life was like or a life was like for this leper. The disease in the Bible that is called leprosy is probably what we call Hansen's disease today. Hansen's disease. Hansen's disease today starts with yellow lesions all over the body, the joints, and the face. They begin to pro progress pretty quickly all over the body. What happens is the fingers and hands start to go numb, the nose, the, the ears, they start to go numb. Then you'll have bleeding in the gums where the gums start to bleed. bleed. A person's hair shortly thereafter starts to turn white and woolly, and then eventually the hair falls out. Um, it, it's unbelievable pain, if you can imagine, in this person's life. The pain was unbearable, and the average lifespan was about 20 years of never-ending, unending pain. But the problem with this disease of leprosy was way deeper than just a physical issue, although that was unbearable. There was a moral judgment attached with leprosy. And this is where we have to understand. Uh, we have to get our minds around this. The moral judgment was this. All his life, since the time he got leprosy, he was taught that this was the judgment of God upon his life for his sin. So this man was in a conundrum where his sin actually led to this leprosy, and he was being punished by God. One rabbi I found uh, online, I was researching this, one rabbi boasted that he would carry stones in his pocket just in case a leper came in contact with him so he could throw them at him. You have to understand, the chasm between a leper and a rabbi, just any rabbi, not Jesus, as we'll see, but a rabbi was immeasurable. A leper never came in contact with a rabbi. A rabbi never came in contact with a leper. Lepers, according to a certain protocol, they had to adhere to certain rules because the people believed that the disease was very contagious. And so when a leper left his home for any reason, the moment he left his home, he had to scream out at the top of his lungs, unclean, unclean. And what would happen is he would never be able to get closer than six feet to a person if the wind was blowing further. If he disobeyed the rules, it was based on the rules and the law, it was the right of the leaders to take him out in public and whip him 40 times on an already sore-filled back. But the biggest issue for the leper I found was this. He could never enter the temple. And if you can't, you probably think, well, that's not really a big deal. Or, Robbie, why is that a big deal? We live in a technological age of Zoom and online church, which many are joining, and so we praise God for that. But that was not the case in the first century. In fact, the temple was the centerpiece of all worship. If you can't go to the temple, then you can't offer a sacrifice. If you can't offer a sacrifice, you can't have your sins forgiven. And if you can't have your sins forgiven, you are perpetually under the judgment of God. And so you, you feel the conundrum he's in. He is a man who's been taught it was because of his sin that he's being judged, but yet he can't go into the temple to make it right by offering a sacrifice to God. This man's whole life, he was taught he was worthless. He was useless. I found one insight. The only thing more defiled than a leper was a dead man. So in essence, this is a dead man walking, if you imagine that. The religious system actually prohibited him from washing his face. They said, you are never to wash your face because it was a perpetual reminder that he lived in a state of uncleanliness. Every time he walked out of his house, he, were to, he was to put a cloth underneath his nose, over his mouth, not to cause people to get infected. So here's what we have in this man. We have a soulless, faceless, worthless, walking dead man. Can you imagine what that did to his psyche? <laughs> can, can you imagine his self-worth at this point when he meets, meets Jesus? Can you imagine the mental trauma this man has gone through? You're probably wondering, why in the world are you belaboring the point about this man's condition? Well, the Bible is interesting. Whenever we see men or experiences or encounters or healings, the Bible is teaching us on different levels insights. 
And one of the insights we're learning here from this man filled outwardly with leprosy is that his outward, con- don't miss this, his outward condition is a picture of his inward sinful heart. Why? Because it's our heart. And you're probably saying, well, what are the connections? Let me give you a couple of them. Leprosy and sin are very similar. Number one is this, leprosy and sin both lead to a depraved life. See, sin in general, just kind of back up. Sin is basically God sets a standard for us of perfection. God says, this is the standard for a relationship with me. You fall below the standard or you don't hit the bullseye, which is sin, missing the mark, then you're out of fellowship with me. This is why we need a perfect sacrifice in the son of Jesus Christ. But sin is missing the mark. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen what? You know this one. Short, you missed the mark, short of the glory of God. No one's righteous, no, not one. All have turned away. All together have become meaningless. No one's righteous, no, not one. So sin destroys a person. All right, how does it destroy a person? Here's how. You may not die when you sin, but you feel like it at times. Anybody ever lived in a season of sin and you feel like you're in this death-like existence? Sin destroys a person. Number two, sin affects every relationship in your life. Students, listen. Uh, Children, when you sin against your parents, you know there is a disconnect between mom and dad. Husbands, when you sin against your wife or wives, when you sin against your husband, particularly in the area of adultery or immorality, It severs the intimacy you once had at a couple and you replace it with anger and jealousy and bitterness, right? I mean, that's what happens. If you're a couple that's not married and you're dating and you're engaging in premarital sex, listen to me, what you're doing is you are marring the image of marriage, which is God's plan for a perfect couple to be married together in union, what you're doing now is you're marring that. What you're doing is you're creating depressive feelings and anxiety, and you're minimizing each other, not only in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of each other. Pornography, the sin of pornography, the sin of immorality. Listen to me, pornography is the sin of idolatry. Did you know this? It's idolatry, why? Because the Bible says anything we get sustenance or satisfaction or pleasure from other than God is idolatry. And so when you look at an image or you look at a website or you look at a video, you are actually bowing down to that image in worship. And what you're doing is this, you are inflicting harm to your soul, harm to, to to your emotions, harm Uh, to your spiritual condition. And so if you're in pornography, you need to understand it is affecting every relationship in your life. Number three, sin sin perpetrates uh, isolation. Perpetrates, perpetuates, perpetrates. That ain't not gonna work. Sin perpetuates isolation. It perpetuates, it it continues to throw fuel on the fire of isolation. Uh, In the business world, it was a great quote that uh, that I found in the business world. Isolation is the, excellent, is the uh, enemy of excellence. Write that down. Isolation is the enemy of excellence. If the enemy can keep you isolated, he wins. That's why you're so tempted to stay home and sleep in and not worship and not, I mean, the enemy wins. He's like, hey, just keep you, keep you isolated, we win. But when you sin, watch this, you are isolated from God. You're separated from God. You're not in fellowship with God. Here's the fourth one, and this is the big one. And this is where we're gonna land the plane. Sin has no earthly cure, none. You you can't be good enough to fix your sin problem. You can't know enough to fix your sin problem. You can't exert enough energy to fix your sin problem. In fact, in Jewish history, you have to understand what's happening here. In Jewish history, no Jewish man or woman had ever been cured of leprosy since Miriam, Moses' sister, in the Old Testament. You have to feel feel the weight of this. Since Miriam in the Old Testament, hundreds and thousands of years before, she is the only known Jewish man or woman to be cured of leprosy. I know what you're saying. What about Naaman? Yeah, he, he was a Gentile. No Jewish person. 
So the, so the rabbis over those years deduced that only the Messiah, when he comes, can cure a person of leprosy. So you gotta understand the height and, and the emotion here. This man has an incurable disease. There is no end in sight. He is untouchable to the world, and yet Jesus is gonna come on the scene and touch him. See, the rabbis believed that the only person that could cure leprosy was one who would take on the leprosy and absorb the leprosy and then overcome the contamination, which leads us to the second insight here. The first one is the seriousness of our condition. Number two, the solution to our problem. His problem, our problem, really. Let's go back and read verse 12. I wanna show you a couple little insights here. This guy really is a model for us when we wanna get right with God. And I know there are different people from different backgrounds, different circumstances, different situations. But I would assume in a group this size, there are some who would say, Pastor Robbie, I need to be made clean today. I need to be right with God today. When Jesus came to one of the towns, the man was there who had leprosy all over him. He saw Jesus fell face down and begged him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me what? Say it with me. Okay, why didn't he say heal me? Why didn't he say make me well? Because that's the same, I mean, that's the same thing. No, he specifically says, make me clean. This is why when we read the gospels, read the New Testament, we wanna slow down because all of these words are specific and there for a reason. Make me clean, you're gonna appreciate this, is a ritual cleansing. It's more than just physical healing. Jesus knew, the man knew, Jesus knew that, he needed that. He wanted a ritual cleansing, why? Because he missed the presence of God. He missed being in fellowship with God. He had no way to be right with God. And so what he's saying is, yes, I wanna be back with family. Yes, I wanna be back with friends. Yes, I wanna be healed, but I miss the presence of God. Look at me. There are some people in here today that you miss the presence of God. There's a time when you were on fire for God. There was a time when that's all you were thirsting and hungering for was righteousness, but those times are long gone. And you have sin in your life and separation and criticism and bitterness and unforgiveness. And since then you've strayed and you're just saying, I need a, this is what you're saying. I need a fresh touch from God today. Is that you? You need a miracle today. You need a healing today in your life. What I love about this man is he's a model for all of us in the sense of, you have to understand, we can assume that this man knew no theological insights from the scriptures. I mean, he wasn't theologically trained. He hadn't been to rabbinical schools. We can assume he hadn't heard the Bible or the scriptures read in years and years because he couldn't go to the temple. He couldn't go to the synagogue. This man has no formal training. And yet, while the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious haughty toddy, if you will, they're criticizing and condemning Jesus, this man who has no training, no messianic theology, runs to Jesus, I imagine him sliding in the home, running to Jesus, you know? And he says, hey, or if you're willing, can you make me clean? I know you can make me clean, are you willing? Here's what he shows us. He takes, watch this, he takes as much as he knows about Jesus. Or I'm sorry, he takes as much faith as he has and he puts it in as much as he knows about Jesus. He takes as much faith as he has, which is little, and he puts it in as much of Jesus as he knows. You know what it shows us? Salvation is not passing a spiritual SAT test. That's not salvation. The Pharisees could do that. Salvation is a heart transformation that comes as a result of faith. And here's a man who humbles himself. And, and, and here's the thing, and I hear this all the time. I can't put my faith in Jesus because I don't have all my questions answered. And then they come to my office and they have a laundry list of questions. You know, where did dinosaurs come from? And you know, who created God? And can God make a stone big enough that he can't? I mean, all these questions, all these questions. And why, you know, what happens to the man in Africa? Has never heard, all these questions. 
That's my favorite. What happens to the man who's never heard the gospel in Africa? Would he go to hell if he never heard the gospel? And my response is always the same. I don't know where that man's gonna go, but the Bible says if he's never trusted in Jesus, he'll go to hell. But the bigger question is, where are you gonna go? Because you heard the gospel and you know Jesus, amen? Where are you gonna go, bro? Forget the, man, forget the straw man argument out there. Where are you gonna grow? Here's the thing, wouldn't you agree with me? There were probably many lepers in the audience that day that watched this man experience a miracle and think, man, I wish I would've gone. Golly, I missed it. How many people were paralyzed because of their unbelief? If I just had all my questions, I mean, I'd come to Jesus. If I just have all the intellect, you know, if I had everything, no, no. That's why it's called faith and not sight or understanding. If it was called faith, if it was called sight and understanding, everybody would believe. It's called faith. Why? Because not everybody has faith. I wonder how many people in the audience, because of pride, man, I'm worried about what people, if I go, what do people gonna think of me? arrogance, intellect. You know, I wonder how many people in here have missed Jesus because of of your intellect, your pride, your arrogance. The question we're gonna answer before we we close is the question that was looming all week in my mind and It's a question I think we need to answer, and the question is this. Why does Jesus touch the man? If leprosy is one notch closer than a dead man as far as on the defilement chart, then what in the world is the holiest, righteous, perfect human being, Jesus, touching this defiled man? And you're probably saying, well, you know, he showed compassion. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's Jesus. Is he touching the untouchable? Yes, that's Jesus but he doesn't have to. You you gotta understand, Jesus will heal many people with just a spoken word, with just, hey, it's already done. Your servant's healed, just go, what are you talking about? You didn't even go to my house. Jesus said, listen, I'm not bound by location or geography. I can heal in a moment. So here's the question, the million dollar question. Why does Jesus reach out his hand and touch the man? Now, according to Jewish law, if his hand touches any part of this defiled man, Jesus has to be isolated for seven days, according to Jewish law. And this is, a, this is not a good argument, I've heard this argument. Well, he's above the law because he created the law, he didn't follow the law. No, no, that's not the, you gotta understand, when Jesus, I'd love to do a series on this. When Jesus breaks the law, it's not the written law he's breaking. He's breaking the oral law of the Pharisees, which is the man-made law. You gotta get that. So the law says if you touch a man, you have to go be isolated for seven days, which I believe Jesus did. But this is what Jesus is teaching. It's more than compassion. It's more than concern. It's more than touching the untouchable. Watch this. When Jesus touches this leper, he's gonna teach us an insight into his identity. This right here is the spiritual shot across the bow to say, I'm the Messiah you guys have been waiting for. Now, how do I know that? The, the Jewish people have, uh, the Jewish culture and the uh, men and women through the years have created something called the Talmud. It's actually called the Mishnah, but out of the Mishnah is the Talmud. So it's basically think of it as a commentary on the Old Testament scriptures. You're probably wondering, why not the New Testament scriptures? The Old Testament is the only scripture they go by, right? So they go with the Old Testament. Now, this is gonna be impactful for some, why? Because these are men and women, particularly men, but men and women who don't believe, who who wrote these things, who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. In fact, before they wrote this, the time they wrote this and after, they still didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, but they believed Isaiah 53 gave them a clue to the role and the identity of the Messiah. And so Isaiah 53, you know that passage, the suffering servant, Jesus on the cross, and it's a big picture. They actually said by reading that passage, when the Messiah comes, you're gonna appreciate this, when the Messiah comes, his name will be called Leper Messiah. Have you heard this before? Leper 
Messiah. Not to be confused with the 1986 Metallica song for those 90s kids like me. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? I know I'm dating myself. That song has nothing to do with this, by the way, so that was kind of a curveball. But Leper Messiah, why? Why would they say that? Well, they wrote about it. Now, you can go look this up yourself. You can access it online. You can actually access the whole Talmud and the whole uh, Mishnah. Sanhedrin 98b, watch this. This is the reference. Sanhedrin 98b, remember, written by Jewish men, Jewish culture that doesn't believe Jesus is the Messiah. They said that his name will be the leper or the sick one, the Messiah. Why? They tell us. In Isaiah 53, yet he himself bore our sicknesses, absorbed our sicknesses, and carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. Now here's what's interesting. They are telling us that when the Messiah comes, he's gonna absorb the sickness on himself, but he won't be sick. Isn't that exactly, listen, Luke chapter five, isn't that exactly what Jesus is doing here? He's gonna take this man's leprosy and take it on himself. He's gonna take this man's sin and absorb it into his life. He's gonna take this man's separation and he's gonna make him whole again. This is exactly why when Jesus finishes, says, oh, no, no, don't tell anybody. In fact, you got one stop, my friend. Go to the priesthood and show them what I just did, thinking they would say, wow, it's the Messiah. He's come. We've been waiting for this guy and he's come. And the reality is they missed it. And the crazy thing is some people in here are gonna miss it. Friends, you gotta understand, Jesus comes to earth and he takes the leprosy and the sin and the separation of this man and makes him whole. When Jesus comes in your life, he takes your weakness upon himself and makes you strong. Jesus takes your separation and brings you close to God. Jesus takes death upon himself so that you and I wouldn't have to die. You're gonna love that. Jesus who knew no sin became sin for us, why? So that you and I would become the righteousness of God. Here's the question we need to answer. It's one thing that Jesus absorbed my sin. The question is, has he absorbed your sin? Has he taken on your sin? One of the industries I wish I would have invested in before COVID was the uh, sanitizer business. Anybody with me? I mean, golly, right? Who knew, who, who knew right? We could have, uh, never worked a day in your life. We actually have a friend, Colin and I have a friend that actually owned a sanitizer business and he was sending me some stats. It's like mind blowing. But uh, I mean, we're all using sanitizer now, right? If you're like my wife, I mean, she's sanitizer Susie. You know, everywhere we go, she got the sanitizer on the menus, sanitizer on the salt shakers, sanitizer on the silverwares, right? Sanitizer on the doors, right? She's got the little cute spray you know, I'm like, does this thing even work? You know, this thing you work. Uh, some of you take it a step further. You lice all the home and you drink thieves for the essential oil girls out there, right? <laughs> I'm an essential oil guy. But we, we're, we're, we're hypersensitive to germs, right? We don't want to get sick, and so I get it. Uh, let's say today someone comes to your home. You spend the afternoon together. You talk about the Lord, and um, you spend time watching TV and eat lunch together, and then they leave. And right after they leave, they call you back and say, hey, I... I hate to say this, but the COVID test just came back. I'm positive. I know I've been at your house all day. I'm sorry. Now, after you get through freezing in a paralysis state, you're like, okay, what do I do? And what you do would be the same thing I would do. You take the Lysol and you Lysol everything, right? Is that what you do? Now, full disclosure, every now and then, every now and then, I'll hold my nose and Lysol my face. I'm do that. My dad said, don't tell those people that. I said, at least I'm not drinking the Lysol. I'm just spraying. But anyway, <laughs> because the reality is if a virus or a disease gets in your body, it can mutate and cause you to be sick, but ultimately it could lead to death. And so we're hypersensitive to that. L listen to me. What I find today is that we have Christians who are more worried about the effects of COVID than they are of the sinful effects in their heart and in their life. For friends, you gotta understand, 
COVID is, I mean, sin is going to damage your life today and send you with damnation to hell tomorrow. That, that's how serious sin is. COVID ends with a physical life, if you have it, or any disease or any illness. Sin has repercussions for eternity. And some of you are so worried about the long-term effects of the vaccine or long-term effects of COVID, and you turn a blind eye and a deaf ear and pay no attention to the long-term and short-term effects of sin. And if you're honest today and you look at your life, you say, Pastor, my life is filled with with lies. I'm eaten up with gossip, jealousy, anger, fear, hatred. Some of you spread gossip and slander online. Some of you just have this incessant obsession with violence into your mind and your heart and sexually lewd acts and images into your mind and heart. And, and you look at your life and you're saying, Pastor, I'm consumed with sin. I am consumed with it. You wanna know why the gospel is so offensive to people? The, the reason the gospel of Jesus Christ is so offensive is because no one wants to admit they're a sinner. Nobody, not even you, right? And I'll prove it to you. I want you to say this with me out loud. Everybody, let's say it out loud. I'm gonna say it first and then you're gonna say it out loud. I am a sinner. Say, say it out loud. Okay, let's say it like, you, like, like we're all in here. Try it at home as well. Let's try it one time. I am a sinner. You feel how awkward that is? You're like, but some of you say, well, I'm not a sinner. I'm a Christian. I, I got saved. I, I get that. I get that. But Paul said at the end of his life, this is Paul, end of his life, 1 Timothy 1.15. Here's a saying that's trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners in which I am the worst. He doesn't say I was the worst, past tense. He says, I am the worst. I want, I want you to imagine if you had to say, I'm a sinner or I'm a leper or I am unclean, unclean, everywhere you went. Uh, imagine life was about broadcasting your private sins in a public way. I think that would change a lot of things. Imagine tomorrow you go to your workplace and as soon as you walk in the door, you have to cry out, adulterer, adulterer. I looked at porn last night when my wife went to bed. Liar, liar, students, I know I'm going to class. I lied to my parents last night, I got them good. Liar, would that change things? Slanderer, slanderer, I cut somebody down on Twitter and Facebook right before I got in the office. Would that change things? Listen, <laughs> you don't even have to say that. God already knows that. See, see, what's hard for us to accept is the fact that you and I are unacceptable. But here's what I know about the gospel. Before the gospel can have transforming power in a person's life, you have to first admit you're dirty before you'll ever experience cleansing. I wanna ask you as we close, has Jesus cleansed you? Is Jesus washed you? And the cool thing about Jesus is when Jesus comes in and cleanses, he cleanses everything. Not just a, a quarter percent cleansing or a 50% or a partial cleanse. No, when Jesus cleanses, he cleanses everything. He makes you whole and complete. And all of us are gonna stand before the Lord one day and you're gonna need to be perfectly cleansed in order to enter into heaven. And God's gonna look at you, he's gonna say, are you cleansed? Has your sins, have your sins been cleansed? Have you been washed? I'm not gonna show up to give a character effort. Well, you need to ask Pastor, oh, Pastor Robbie knows, we bring Pastor Robbie. No, I'm not gonna be able to come give a character. Your mom and dad's not gonna be able to step in and say, well, he's a good kid, you know, he went to class. And not gonna happen. Listen, the only people, the only person who knows if you're cleansed is you and God. And so I don't want you to miss this moment, uh, I'm gonna ask you in just a moment, if you,
If you need a miracle today, I feel like in a group this size, you're saying, man, I, I'm like the leper. I don't have leprosy, but I've got leprosy of the heart. I feel separated. I feel isolated. I'm out of fellowship with family or friends or mom or dad or husband, and I need a touch from, I need a fresh touch from God. I miss the presence of God. I'm gonna ask you in just a moment to just bow down and I'm just gonna pray a prayer over you. And then I'm just gonna ask you to just stay and linger and do business with God. You've already heard enough from me. I want you to hear from God. I don't want you to miss this opportunity. So let's just bow our head for just a moment. If you're in here today and you're saying, Pastor, I'm far from God and something you said or a word you spoke, the image of the leper, the picture of his outward condition, that's my heart and heart. And I haven't honestly been so honest with God to admit that I'm dirty and I need to be cleansed. If you're far from God today and you need a fresh touch from God, you miss the presence of God, would you just come, just come right out of your seat. You don't have to tell me anything. I'm not gonna talk to you. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna call you out. I'm just asking you to come and bow before the Lord. Why are you asking me to bow, Robbie? Because every person we're gonna read about and encounter in the book of Luke publicly took a stand for Jesus. And I wonder how many say, well, I wish I would have, but I, no, no, I'm gonna ask you to come. So you just come and bow down. Maybe you're in here today and you're saying, Pastor, I am a believer, but I need a fresh touch today from God. I miss the presence of God. I need a miracle from God today. Would you just come? Just run out of your seat, you come. Thank you. Others are coming. You just come. You just come. Don't you dare be ashamed. I'm sure a lot of lepers were ashamed and they missed it. You don't want to miss a miracle that God can do in your life today if you humble yourself and come to him. If you need a personal touch, if you're in the balcony, you come. We'll wait for you. If you're at home, you want to make your couch or your sofa an altar. Uh, you want to make your sofa, sofa an altar, you just bow before the Lord right now. If you need a touch from God, you come. If you need God to cleanse your heart, if you have an addiction maybe in your life, Pastor, I resonate with you. I can't break it. Every night I go to bed, I'll never do it again. Every morning I wake up, I'm back into the cycle. I need prayer. I need prayer. If that's you, you come. Others are already coming. You come. I'm going to need prayer. You cannot break this alone. I promise you. You cannot heal yourself alone. I promise you. No earthly power can break sin in your life. It's Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the solution. So others are coming moment longer. Don't miss this. I'm telling you, if you're thinking, man, I, I probably regret that I didn't come when I get in the car, I get home, then come, then you come. If you're a Gallatin, you come. If you're online, you come moment longer. I'm just going to pray over you right now. Pray. I'm going to bow down and pray with you. I'm going to ask for a fresh touch from God. One moment in the presence of God is better than a thousand hours elsewhere, I promise you. God can do more in a moment than a man or woman can do in a lifetime. So we're gonna ask God to do what only he can do. Would you pray with me? Father, we, first of all, we humble ourselves before you. Like the man who fell face down, prostrate on the ground. He knew exactly who you were. He knew exactly what you could do and he didn't know much and he didn't have all the answers, but he knew enough to come risk his life. God, if the religious leaders caught him in the presence of Jesus, he would lose his life possibly, and yet he risked it all because he was desperate to be healed. God, I feel like there are people here desperate for a healing. They are desperate for your presence. They are desperate and hungry for you. God, make us a people that we are the hungriest for your presence more than anyone else. There would nobody, be no one more hungry than us for your presence and righteousness. God, I pray right now for whatever issue is in their life, God, that is separating them from you, 
that is overwhelming them or paralyzing them or crippling them, God, their relationships? Would you restore relationships now with mother and daughter, father and son, mother and son and daughter and father? God, I pray right now you restore relationships between husbands and wives and wives and husbands. God, I pray you restore ultimately our relationship with you. Holy Spirit, would you fall fresh upon us now? Heal us in such a way, God, that it would be a testimony to those around us that you're real. And God, as we continue to spend time, even after I finish praying, God, let us linger and let us allow you to do a deep work in our hearts. Let us not be in a rush as we sing and worship. Meet us here right now. Meet us here, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name.